It has become increasingly clear in the minds of many citizens that a degree of influence over the structures of elected governments is pushing our society towards determined goals that have little to do with the well-being of the majority of citizens or national governments of this earth. This power above nation states did not emerge overnight. Any attempt to understand history while ignoring the active role of secret societies would result in a dismal failure. Sadly, due to this scant evidence, which such secret organizations leave to posterity, such investigations are often messy and riddled with confusion and misinformation. Those attempting to make sense of the conspiracy shaping history, for good or for evil, often conclude falsely that secret societies are either all-powerful, endowed by their initiates with secret knowledge knowable only to the inner elites, or that such societies could not possibly exist due to the fact that human beings are too stupid to keep secrets or maintain a conspiracy stretching across multiple generations. We will soon see why both assumptions are wrong by evaluating the nature of secret societies and the growth of intelligence operations as instruments of social control stretching far back into the days of ancient Greece and upward to our current age. Many are aware of the inscription at the Cult of Apollo at Delphi, which oversaw a network of broad intelligence operations, banking, and perception management on behalf of an elite network of initiates, priests, and ruling families. This quote has been treated as words of wisdom, which is why kings, emperors, statesmen, and generals from all quarters of the ancient world would travel to the temple with a very generous payment in gold in hopes that the wisdom of the great god Apollo would be bestowed on them and give strength and power to their particular cause. One of the most famous prophecies made by the cult of Delphi, according to the ancient Greek historian Herodotus, was to King Croesus of Lydia. King Croesus was a very rich king and the last bastion of the Ionian cities against the increasing Persian power in Anatolia. King Croesus wished to know whether he should continue his military campaign deeper into Persian Empire territory alone, or whether he should seek a military alliance in such a feat. According to Herodotus, the amount of gold King Croesus delivered was the greatest ever bestowed upon the Temple of Apollo. In return, the priestess of Delphi, otherwise known as the Oracle, would spout nonsensical babble intoxicated by the gas vapors of the chasm over which she was conveniently placed. The priests would then translate the oracle's prophecy into an ambiguous message from the gods. The king was told, if Croesus goes to war, he will destroy a great empire. Croesus was also told to ally himself with the most powerful Greek state, and he chose Sparta. Croesus was overjoyed and thought his victory guaranteed and immediately began working towards building his military campaign against Persia. In the end, Croesus lost everything and Lydia was taken over by the Persians. The Spartans never showed up. The empire Croesus destroyed was his own. The words inscribed at the Temple of Apollo, Know thyself, nothing to excess, surety brings ruin, served as a forewarning to anyone who dared to seek the assistance of the priests in the pursuit of wisdom and power. We are told that those who were worthy of the god Apollo would have the wisdom to solve the riddle of their prophecy and would prevail in their endeavors. Those unworthy of Apollo's good graces would fail and be ruined. It is a nice story, but in reality, 
just a brilliant cover for a global intelligence racket. The cult of Delphi was indeed the nerve center of military and political intelligence that had no allegiance to any state or empire, but rather was able to use intelligence that they collected with their networks of spies, along with the intelligence they were given by those foolish enough to lay out their plans and their goals to them. The priests of Delphi would then decide thereupon what information needed to be shared with what target to fit what purpose. This power to shape wars, alliances, and cultural policy was vast, and the kings, generals, and city-states that followed their council became little more than pawns on a grand chessboard. The true question for those who dared to visit the cult of Delphi wasn't really about whether or not they had the wisdom needed to solve the oracle's prophecies, but rather, what kind of pawn would they be to the priests of Apollo? The Scottish Rite of Freemasonry was formally organized in the United States in 1801 as a group of Tory partisans who had found themselves on the losing side of the American Revolution. One of the principal men involved from the very beginning was a British general by the name of Augustine Prevost. Prevost had conquered Charleston, South Carolina, and set up a secret police apparatus there which became the Scottish Rite headquarters after the British Army had left. The Scottish Rite would come to rule over American Freemasonry during the 19th century and exert undue influence on federal law enforcement, which continues to this day. J. Edgar Hoover, who oversaw the growth of a shadow government inside the USA during the course of eight presidencies, was himself a 33rd degree Mason of the Scottish Rite. Coronated in 1955 after 35 years of devout membership. To understand the role played on the Grand Chessboard by J. Edgar Hoover and the Scottish Rite, we would not get far without appreciating the role of a man named Albert Pike. In 1859, Albert Pike, General of the Confederate Armies during the Civil War, was elected Sovereign Grand Commander of the Scottish Rite's Southern Jurisdiction. In 1871, Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, the Anti-Bible of the Rite, was first published by Pike. If one is to understand what constitutes the morals and dogma of such a membership, to which Hoover entered the innermost circle, it will become clear that not only does the right act as an opposing church to Christianity, but that pledging one's allegiance to the secret society is understood as coming before all else in the material world, including government and country. Writing about top-down organization, Pike wrote the following in his book, Morals and Dogma. The blue or lower degrees are but for the outer court of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. It is not intended that he shall understand them, but it is intended that he shall imagine he understands them. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry. These are the very same techniques used by the cult of Delphi with the understanding that the true explication of the symbols will only be understood by those supposedly worthy of them, that is, the adepts, who are the princes of masonry. How does one know if one is a prince of masonry? Those who are foolish enough to have complete faith in the magic of the occult will give an honest attempt to understand such symbols. However, the truth of the matter is that those who are moved closer to the inner sanctum are merely chosen for their usefulness as instruments of a higher will. While this person might be a pawn who plays the determining role in a checkmate, they remain nevertheless just a pawn within 
a great game they never controlled or even understood. Pike would also write in his Morals and Dogma, Men are but the automata of providence, and providence uses the demagogue, the fanatic, and the knave as its tools and instruments to effect that which they do not dream, and which they imagine themselves commissioned to prevent. Here it becomes clear that the majority of mankind is considered by the right as an instrument of providence, and that to do the will of such providence justifies that the right treat mankind as such. We will see shortly what sort of providence they are speaking of. Perhaps most alarming are Pike's views of God and what is to be considered good. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the higher degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, the God of the Christians, whose deeds prove his cruelty, perfidy and hatred of man, barbarism and repulsion to science, would Adonai and his priests calumniate him? Yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai is also God. For the eternal law is that there is no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, no white without black. For the absolute can only exist as two gods. The true and pure philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. But Lucifer, the god of light and god of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the god of darkness and evil. In later years, the body of Albert Pike would be interred inside the Washington, D.C. temple's walls. A few feet away from his body is a complete replication of the office and desk of their second most honored member, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. It should also be known that much of the FBI is implicated in the Scottish Rite. For instance, there are certain Washington lodges which have a disproportionately high number of FBI agents in them, such as the Alexandria Lodge. On December 17, 1906, Teddy Roosevelt promoted his Navy Secretary, Charles J. Bonaparte, to the position of Attorney General of the United States. Bonaparte lost no time in telling Congress that the Department of Justice must be given a force of permanent police under its control. On May 27, 1908, Congress pushed back against Bonaparte's demands by prohibiting all executive departments from using Secret Service agents as policemen, including the Justice Department. During this period, only the Treasury Department had the authority to use Secret Service men. To get around this block from Congress, on July 26, 1908, Attorney General Bonaparte, on Teddy Roosevelt's instructions, ordered the creation of an investigative agency within the Department of Justice, which later became known as the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It was the start of what would become an unelected shadow government in the heart of the USA, in direct opposition to the rule of self-government. In the midst of this slow takeover of the government, a 22-year-old J. Edgar Hoover was first recruited to play a special role within a great game. The year was 1917. Just out of law school, Hoover was put in charge of the Department of Justice's War Emergency Division's Enemy Alien Bureau and was quickly immersed in the wildly lawless wartime counterinsurgency of the first Red Scare from 1917 till 1920. Anton Chaikin writes of this period in his paper, Hoover's FBI and Anglo-American Dictatorship. Attorney General Palmer created a general intelligence or radical division in the Bureau of Investigation and appointed Hoover its head. Military intelligence and Hoover's agents working together as a single secret service 
now built up a network of civilian vigilante spies, informers, and provocateurs. These auxiliaries were then set loose in the Palmer raids, a war on unions, radicals, civil rights advocates, teachers, and immigrants. From November 1919 to January 1920, this initial descent into a police state was, however, deeply opposed by the American population and sparked popular protests and outrage. J. Edgar Hoover was well fitted as Palmer's deputy in overseeing the political mass arrests, deportations, lynchings, terror propaganda, and witch hunts. Hoover would put a Southern white Masonic unit inside the Bureau itself, called the Fidelity Chapter, and insist that his agents refer to the Bureau and his office as the seat of government. When the Great Depression hit in 1929, J. Edgar Hoover blamed the general lawlessness on inefficient, corrupt local politicians and police. What was the solution? More power to the Bureau. While campaigning for the presidency, Franklin Roosevelt installed his close friend, Montana Senator Thomas J. Walsh, as the 1932 Democratic Convention chairman. In 1921, Walsh had led the battle at the Senate hearings on the Justice Department's illegal practices. During the hearings, he confronted Palmer and his deputy Hoover with evidence that they had perpetrated an orgy of terror violence and crime against the citizens of the USA. Walsh remained in the Senate as J. Edgar Hoover's dedicated enemy. Franklin Roosevelt won the election on November 8, 1932, and was to take office in March 1933. On February 15, 1933, a low-level Italian Freemason named Giuseppe Zangata shot at President-elect Roosevelt. He missed and ended up killing the Chicago mayor, Anton Cermak, instead. Weeks after this failed assassination attempt, Franklin Roosevelt publicly announced that he would appoint Senator Thomas J. Walsh as U.S. Attorney General. On March 1st, the New York Times reported Walsh's pledge that he would reorganize the Department of Justice when he assumes office, probably with an almost completely new personnel. It is said that Walsh had declared that one of his first acts would be to oust J. Edgar Hoover. Walsh was found dead the next morning while on a train to Washington, D.C. for Roosevelt's March 4th inauguration and his own swearing in. Starting in July 1933, a group of American Legion officials paid by J.P. Morgan's men asked Marine Corps General Smedley Butler to lead a coup d'etat against President Roosevelt. When General Butler had gathered enough evidence of the plot, he went to J. Edgar Hoover for action. Hoover refused to do anything, stating that there was no evidence a federal criminal statute had been violated. Finding no luck with the FBI, General Butler changed gears and went to the Special Committee on Un-American Activities, known as the McCormick-Dickstein Committee, which began an investigation on November 20th, 1934. Within a month, the committee corroborated all of Butler's claims, but they took no action since Franklin Roosevelt wished to use these findings as leverage against the Wall Street financiers who had formerly been working against his New Deal reforms tooth and nail. In order to bring the message to the American people, Butler arranged to have his testimonial outlining the coup plot recorded and broadcast across the nation by Universal Studios on December 28, 1935. Franklin Roosevelt died on April 12, 1945, and World War II ended five months later. The OSS would be dissolved three weeks after the end of the war. The CIA was officially created two years later, 
now purged of its FDR patriots. Following this, the FBI continued to impose a dictatorship on the population domestically, while the new CIA became the instrument selected to advance an Anglo-American empire internationally. Throughout his short-lived presidency, John F. Kennedy worked valiantly to revive Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal within the context of the 1960s. He launched great mega-projects, denounced the Malthusian outlook, fought to end the Cold War, and pulled U.S. troops out of Vietnam. Kennedy additionally fired CIA chief Alan Dulles, who had led that organization for eight years, with the young president threatening to break the renegade agency into a thousand pieces and scatter it into the winds. On November 22, 1963, President Kennedy was brutally murdered in the streets of Dallas, Texas in broad daylight. On November 29, 1963, the Warren Commission under the control of Alan Dulles was set up to investigate the murder of President Kennedy. The old congressman Hale Boggs of Louisiana, an ally of Franklin Roosevelt, was a member of that Warren Commission. Boggs became increasingly disturbed by the lack of transparency and rigor exhibited by the commission and became convinced that many of the documents used to incriminate Oswald were in fact forgeries. In 1965, Representative Boggs told New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison that Oswald could not have been the one who killed Kennedy. It was Boggs who encouraged Garrison to begin the only trial of the president's murder to this day. After the murder of John F. Kennedy's brother, Robert, who was running for the presidency in 1968 and would surely have won, Nixon was inaugurated on January 20th, 1969. Hale Boggs soon after called on Nixon's Attorney General, John Mitchell, to have the courage to fire J. Edgar Hoover. It wasn't long thereafter that the private airplane carrying Hale Boggs disappeared without a trace. Jim Garrison was the district attorney of New Orleans from 1962 to 1973 and was the only person to bring forth a trial concerning the assassination of President Kennedy. In Jim Garrison's book, On the Trail of the Assassins, published in 1991, J. Edgar Hoover comes up several times impeding or shutting down investigations into JFK's murder. In particular, concerning the evidence collected by the Dallas Police Department such as the nitrate test Oswald was given, and which in fact exonerated him, proving that he had never fired a rifle shot on the day of November 22, 1963. However, for reasons only known to the government and its investigators, this fact was kept secret for 10 months. It was finally revealed in the Warren Commission report, which inexplicably didn't change their opinion that Oswald had shot Kennedy. Today, there are those who continue to discredit the work of Jim Garrison for the crime of challenging the absurd narrative of the Warren Commission. However, anyone who bothers to read the Warren Commission report would soon discover it to be a mess of contradictions, fallacies, and outright fabrications. Not only an absurd sham, but ultimately complicit in one of the most disgraceful cover-ups in American history. When will the American people realize that the biggest threat to American freedom is not from without, but from within its very own walls, where it has been prominently residing for the last 112 years? The question remains, what allowed the growth of this parasitical occultism within the USA since the earliest days of the Republic over 200 years ago? Was the success of this Masonic force caused by the supposed secret knowledge of its initiates? Or was it due to the naivete of the population and the embrace of insanity by an oligarchical class? The fact is, that over the course of 2,500 years, 
since the days of Croesus's downfall, occult secret societies continue to use the same elementary techniques of deception to achieve their geopolitical aims. Although the outward form has changed over the millennia, the essential character of these Masonic orders has not changed. With priesthoods controlling the rites and rituals, carefully designed to make soft-minded fools more soft-minded and more foolish as they increasingly lose their own identities in the pursuit of the ever-fleeting promise of secret knowledge. Whether the initiate is named Albert Pike, J. Edgar Hoover, or a King Croesus of Lydia, the result is the same. The nations which these superstitious figures thought they were saving were ultimately the very thing which their blind faith in the occult ended up destroying from within. The remedy to such decay has always been located in the break from the trance of mysticism and the worshipping of symbolism which such occult societies demand in both their initiates and victims alike. In the days of ancient Greece, this remedy was identified in the form of a philosopher king, a Solon, a Thales, or a Plato, whose love of humanity and God was matched only by the concern for the health of their own immortal souls. Such was the nature of the fountain upon which they drew for their wisdom, courage, and creativity in the course of lives devoted to something much more than simple power or secret knowledge. In our modern age, this force for good has taken the form of statesmen with names like Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, Martin Luther King Jr., and John F. Kennedy, who all gave their lives for the cause of humanity and God's law. These were men who overcame the fear of their own mortality and rose to a higher domain of identity that saw their purpose in the extinguishing of lies, injustice, and the uplifting of all humanity to a better way. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, 
no secret is revealed. It conducts the Cold War in short, with a wartime discipline no democracy would ever hope or wish to match.